Hey, hey everybody and welcome back to the board meeting. Today we're doing another r, &R video, reviewing and rating all the different games I've been playing in the past two weeks with friends, family, and even solo. But we're doing something a little bit different this week. I'm just taking four little card games that I've been playing lately instead of all the different games, but I'm going to just talk about the four little card games that I've been playing and kind of make this a little bit of a smaller little video for all of you. So I got four little card games. And unfortunately, none of them are solo games. So this is all multiplayer, so we don't have to worry about solitaire play for this one. So I got four little card games. Some of them are new games. Some of them are older games. But let's just jump right into it with our first game of this week. And the first game is Enchanted Plumes. And I believe this came out last year. And in this game, you are trying to build these plumes uh, for these peacocks. And a plume is like the, the feathers of that peacock. And you are placing these cards to make an inverted pyramid. Now, how you're going to be placing these is on your turn, you are either going to put down one or two cards into these peacock arrays. And on the top row, it's going to be all the cards that are on the top row of that peacock plume is going to be worth negative points. And then you're going to start, start building uh, the, this inverted pyramid on them. But once you, once you decide... You can make the, the plumes as long as you want. But, just so you know, once the game ends, all the cards on top are going to be worth negative points. Uh, so you build, build it as big as you want, and then you're going to put uh, one card less on the next row, and the next, and so on and so forth, until you have completed that inverted pyramid. But you can have several peacock plumes going at the same time. What's now, uh, also, there's going to be ten different colors of these cards that you're laying down. Uh, for each row that you've placed, the next row that you're building onto that plume, it has to contain a color from the, the row above it. So that makes for some inter interesting choices. Now, after you have placed one or two cards, and sometimes you're not going to want to place one or two cards, you can you have to either draw two cards from this deck, exchange two cards from your hand with this line of cards that is out there for available for everyone, or you can do a combination of them, exchanging one card and drawing one card. Now, this is a game that I, I like better than I thought I was going to. I'm giving it a 7.5. This game has a bunch of interesting choices. There is going to be luck involved in this game, but it's a fast game. Uh, I was playing it at two players, and I was playing it at five players. Even the five-player game, I think, took us 30 minutes, if that. And so, yeah, it's, it's got some interesting choices. But what really, really stands out in this game is it's a beautiful-looking card game. There are not, like, a ton of, like, beautiful-looking card games that will make people stop and look what you're playing. This is one of those, especially at the end of the game when everybody's got their all their peacocks out, and it's just a beautiful array of these cards. So, yeah, interesting choices, really good-looking game. 7.5 for Enchanted Plumes. Let's go to the next game. The next is a two-player-only trick-taking game. This is Jekyll versus Hyde. And like I said, it's a two-player trick-taking game where one player plays as Jekyll, the other player plays as Hyde. Now, Jekyll, you're going to play ten tricks each each round, and you have three rounds. Uh, Jekyll, Dr. Jekyll, wants to have a balance. So he wants to win five tricks and lose five tricks, or as close to possible. So win six tricks and lose four tricks. It doesn't really matter what you're winning or losing, you just want it to be a balance. Hyde is the opposite. Say in the 10 tricks, you know, he wants to win uh, 10 of those tricks, or he wants to lose 10 of tricks. Like I said, it doesn't matter, but he wants an imbalance. He wants one player to have more cards than the other. And at the end of the round, there is this track with this really cool looking miniature uh, statue thing. There's 10 spots. And whatever the difference is between the tricks, how many tricks the players took, you move the, the Jekyll statue that many spaces. So if one player won seven tricks, the other player won three, the difference is four. You move that statue four spaces along that path. And so there is a little bit more gimmicks to it as well. There are special powers. There are these potion cards that will activate and will do whatever the, the other card that was played that trick. And the, the powers are stuff like exchanging two cards, uh, taking an extra trick from a player, from an extra trick from one that they've won previously, or just moving these other uh, tokens off the board. And the tokens are interesting as well. 
uh, as soon as you play a card's color, it goes onto this board. And that will dictate how powerful your cards are, which is the, the king card or whatever they're called. And so that will dictate who, which color will kind of win. If a player plays a green card, you have to play a green card if you have it. If not, you can play any color. And whoever wins that trick, that's dictated by the, the power of that card currently. So yeah, it's it's a little bit strange. It's a little bit strange for a trick-taking game, but now trick-taking games have to have these little gimmicks, or else if they're just a straight trick-taking game, they're not very memorable. This one is interesting. It's getting a 6.5 rating from me, because there's a couple good things and a couple bad things uh, I like about it. First, um, as far as the pros, I just, like I said, it's an interesting game. There's interesting mechanics. Uh, I really like that, that trying to either what, what you're, which character you're playing as will dictate how you want to play the game. And playing it two different ways, it, it just makes it interesting. And with all the, the card powers and stuff like that, it's interesting. Now my cons is kind of the same thing, is the, pl the powers and the things just make this game very chaotic sometimes. I feel like I don't have much of a say whether I'm going to win or lose in this game. A lot of, you know, trick-taking games a lot of times depend on luck anyways because of the cards you're dealt. But this one is even more random. Exchanging cards and taking extra tricks and stuff like that. It feels like a lot of times I'm not too much in control. There's a lot of chaos in this game. But it doesn't matter too much because it's, uh, it is a short game. But it's going to get a 6.5 rating, so just another average game. Check it out if you like trick-taking games. Going to the next game, our next game is a game that is extremely popular, or it used to be. It's considered a classic. I've never played this game before two weeks ago. This is for sale, and I got this package, and it's only about this big, this little card box, basically. And this is an older game, like I said, and I, I can't, I've always wanted to play, but I've never gotten my hands on this. And this is a very simple, like, auction bidding game. Now, there's two phases in for sale. The first phase, you are trying to bid on these estates that are coming up for sale. And so you put out these estates, and the estates are numbered 1 through 30. And you put out an, as many estates as there are players. So if you have a five-player game, you're going to put out five of these estates. And they could be, you know, a 3, an 8, a 13, a 24, and maybe at the 30 even. Now, players are going to take turns bidding on these, these estates or passing. If you bid, you have a certain amount of money, you can bid on these. The next player can either uh, surpass your bid or pass. If you pass, you take the lowest estate number that is available right, right there. And say the, the, it goes around the whole table and it comes back to you and you've already bid, you can then pass. And then you will take the lowest estate like before. But if you've bid already, you have to pay... Uh, half of your bid uh, rounded up. So if you pay, had bid five, and then it comes to you and you pass, you have to pay three of that, and then you take the lowest estate card, and you keep the other two, two money. Now you're going to do that and run out the deck, and then you go to the second phase of this game. The second phase is very similar to the first, but this is going to be currency. Now you're going to flip over as many currency cards as there are players, and the currency is numbered zero through 15. Now, each player is going to take the estates that they've won in the previous phase of the game and secretly take one of them, put them down face down, and then everybody at the same time is going to reveal them. Whoever has the highest estate uh, revealed is going to take whatever the highest currency is in that line. Uh, it's very interesting, that part. And whoever's got the lowest is going to take the lowest. So you whoever's got the highest gets the highest then the second gets the second highest and so on and so forth so it makes for interesting especially that reveal since it's it's not known information what you're going to be putting down so i really like that and then at the end of the game whoever's got the most currency cards left plus any currency that you have left from the the first phase of that game the highest score wins this is a, oh man i can't believe I've, I've never played this game and I should have played it a long, long time ago. This is a great filler game. I'm giving, giving this game an 8 rating. This is going to stick in my collection forever now. I believe it is. I it warrants that classic title that people talk about. Now I know why people have been talking about it for years and years. I mean, this is an old game. It still holds up very well. It is going to get played 
pretty often and it's going to be one that I'm going to show new people into the hobby with. And in fact, I've shown three new people this game particularly and they all seem to re really enjoy it. So yeah, For Sale is getting a very high rating of 8. Let's go to our last game of the week, which is Autumn Harvest, a Tea Dragon Society game. A very long name. Now this is a deck building game of sorts, but it's, it's different than your regular deck building game where you draw a hand of cards, use those cards, and then you just continue doing that. In this game, you are either going to draw one card, putting it into your hand, or array of cards that you have, or you're going to buy one card from the market. And your cards are going to have two kind of two, two or three pieces of information that you need to pay attention to. One is the buying power, the, the money basically for that card that you're going to be using to buy cards that are in the marketplace or in this memory section that's going to be worth points. There, there's points on the bottom, I think it's on the bottom right, I am not can't remember, but there's going to be buying power and points. Then the, some cards will actually have effects on them and that you're going to do exactly what that card says. So yeah, it's it's an interesting game in that uh, you're just drawing one card of, at a time to put in your your hand, and then you're the next turn you're going to decide either spend that that on cards that are in the the marketplace, or you're you're going to buy cards in the marketplace, or just draw another card. It's interesting in that way because that's one of I think that's the only deck building game that I've ever played like this. This, but for me, this game is going to get. A six rating. So it's not going to be one that I'm going to play too often, but it is, the pros for it is that it's cute, it's light, it's family friendly, it's a great way to introduce people to deck building, especially young children. I, I like the artwork on it. It's a very cute, friendly game. The cons for me is that for such a light, small game, it's going to take a while. We were playing a two-player game of this, and it was still taking 30, 45 minutes sometime. So I couldn't imagine playing a four-player game of this. And the fact for me, myself, it's probably going to be pretty forgettable. I think in maybe a couple months, I'm going to have a hard time remembering, remembering what game this is even. But it is, for getting a six rating for myself, it's not for me. But I think I would definitely recommend it for people who have small children in their family or people if you want to teach someone the deck building uh, mechanic this is a great game for that i'm going to give my copy to a friend who's got small children and i think they're going to really enjoy this game but six rating from myself but either way uh that's going to wrap up this reviews and ratings episode if you did enjoy this video make sure to like and subscribe to see more weekly content from me shane at the board meeting in the future Hope you all have an amazing day. Take care, everyone.